Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, maybe we, shall, we start just for for people missing, but I think in the interest of making it in time, it may drag on for a while. So I think we should go. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the first Rust bonsai workshop. So usually new users, when they see bonsai for the first time, they see the language. They see the, the visual programming language that allows you to create and manipulate these data streams. And they see the packages that give convenient features for uh, processing data or acquiring and saving data. And, um, but really there's a third component that is there. Uh, there is something to be said that you can actually teach bonsai uh, without mentioning this third component, but if you really want to, to master the language and to be able to extend it, we, you really need to go into it. And the first component is what's indicated in the slides as a Rx, so this is the reactive extensions. And it's essentially um, a framework that um, extend, in it originally extended .NET to handle um, asynchronous programming. And we will go in detail as to what, what this means. Um, and it's, and the goal, so the goal of this workshop is to open up the, the black box that is bonsai by basically starting straight away into Rx, which is really, I think, the, the way that it should be done. And we never did it, so it's the first time we will start this way. And um, we'll see how how and um, how good this makes it clear. Um, so the first rule of the workshop is to actually be reactive and uh, ask questions. And uh, the reason why this is particularly important is uh, we imagined that uh, all of you come from various different levels of experience and ex higher exposure to asynchronous programming or not. And even just in programming in general. So we wanted to kind of start everything from scratch from the ground up. But because there's so much material, it's done in a way that is very, a bit synthetic. So it's a bit fast uh, to what it could be. So it's important that if at any moment you get lost, that you stop me right away and uh, clarify uh, everything. Because this is a bit like uh, incremental. So we will build up on uh, initial concepts and then it will always build uh, on the previous concept, so if you, if you get lost, there's a chance that you may lose the train. So please, please, at any moment, if it's not clear, it's probably because you didn't do a good job. So it's better to assume that's the case and just stop me, okay? So just reviewing the, the, the program for uh, these four days. Um, so this is the, the topic for, uh, for each day. So the, the first day is today, and we will cover uh, what I call uh, the path from databases to data streams. And this is really about uh, reactive, uh, just about what the reactive extensions mean for data processing in general, and what it means for uh, handling data in the world where we are today, where everything is parallel and distributed <laughs> and we have processes all over and we need to handle all this complexity. And this is really where a uh, um, paradigm like Rx uh, revolutionized the way we program. And it's a bit non-conventional to how um, still people today are used to program, so it's, it's good that we cover this in detail. So there's a whole day just for this. And only on the second day, well, we will go into bonsai a little bit at the end of today, but mostly the, the, in detail we will cover the, the, the visual language and the bonsai toolboxes on the second day. And um, hopefully by that time things will make um, an entirely different sense as you look into bonsai as a really a, a, a visual language built on top of Rx. Then the third day we will go again a bit into Rx more in depth, uh, looking at uh, all of the um, what they call combinators. So combinators is operators, it's kind of the same thing. They, if you go to, the, to their website, you'll see a list of all of them, and we will cover mostly um, what they have which is important to, for you to get a feeling of how these operators really allow you to have an algebra for data stream. So to use it as uh, operators that you take um, some given streams and you create other streams and you can really get, can really allow you to do very powerful things, uh, but you need to understand in detail how 
each operator works, and we will, we will do that on the third day. Then the fourth day is actually a bit um, fuzzy still in the sense that uh, we want to cover more advanced aspects of where we can go with uh, languages like this. Um, it can actually entirely change this day, depending on your feedback and how the other days go. Uh, for now, um, we have this tentative schedule of um, a topic that we think is interesting the, and, and that is also powerful to do with uh, these reactive data streams, which is representing the street states. And uh, the, the idea here is really usually you, you look at data streams in bonsai as something you start, they acquire some data continuously, and then at some point you stop. But sometimes you really want to have these discrete transitions into modes of operation. Like, for example, if you have um, <coughs> your, um, your tasks split into trials, or if you have uh, some kind of um, stakes in your data acquisition that you need to transition between, and this will kind of change completely the way you process your data, how do you represent that within this, um, within this paradigm? So that will be the... I don't know, it's one idea for the fourth day, but maybe this entirely changes given what, what you guys have referred to. So, any questions about this? Um, okay. okay. Cool, so let's head on then straight to the first topic. So from databases to data streams, so what does this really mean? And to me, what it really means is kind of, I try to summarize it in this uh, slide, which is, it's funny, like, uh, there are almost as many data structures as there are algorithms, okay? So the, when you have some kind of computation you want to do, you also need to organize uh, your data in some way that you manipulate to achieve some uh, goal you have. Um, and there are many ways to actually structure your data. So some of them, probably most of them or all of them are familiar to you. So you have arrays, which is these contiguous sequences in memory. It can be 1D, 2D, 3D, ND, whatever, and, um, but then you have other ways of organizing the data, like uh, linked lists, you have uh, trees that now the um, elements are really not uh, Im immediately contiguous, you have to kind of navigate this tree to get to each one of them, or you can even go more complicated uh, graphs where elements can have these arbitrary relationships between them, and really each one of these data structures is optimized for a particular set of operations, so some Usually, it all boils down to how you search within the data structure, so how you can access the elements. Um, and depending on which, which things you want to do, you may want to pick a different data structure for, um, for your goal. And of course, this is not even including the, the particular domain organization for your problem, but it can be, um, I don't know, maybe some, sometimes you're talking about uh, records of people, sometimes you're talking about something else, and everything becomes really concrete. However, even though there's all this diversity, it also turns out that many of the bulk operations you want to do over data are actually quite independent of the details of the data structure. So for example, let's take the simple operation of summing. So I just want to sum all the elements <coughs> in my data structure. If this is the case, then I don't really care if the data is aligned in a 1D array or 2D array or 3D or if it's a list or a tree or a graph. Well, the only thing I want to do is however many elements there are, I want to add them all together. And if I want to do this, really the only operation that I need is to know how to traverse the data structure. So if it's an array or a list, it can be it's just a linear, you just start at the beginning and you increment your index or pointer in one direction, uh, and if it's a 2D array, you have to find some kind of way to also traverse the matrix. It can be, you can start uh, column-wise column, column -wise or you can start row-wise. Uh, if it's a tree, now you have, there's also many decisions. You can start doing what they call a depth-first search, so you start going deep in one path and then you explore it to the end and then you go back. Or you can go <coughs> search, so you can kind of traverse it first with the children like that. So there's some decisions. Um, sorry. So the, but it really doesn't matter um, for for the sum operation. It doesn't really matter how you do it. The only thing that matters is that you go to all the elements. Okay. And, and it turns out that there are many, many, many operations like this. 
And it turns out that, uh, and as we will see later, even actually all of the operations we know from databases, actually the only thing that they care about is that you can iterate the, 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 your data structure like, like this. So how would you, would you, um, how would you um, provide this kind of abstraction that seems very useful of <coughs> the, the, the data in the data structure? So you, this, this is it. So this is the, the, the interface. You design a contract. So the idea would be that it is very convenient, it would be very convenient if all these data structures provided a way for you to just ask what your elements are uh, in a way that is standard. So in a way that uh, would be the same no matter if it's a tree or an array or whatever, okay? And this interface, the, it, it exists in many, many different programming languages. This is a C-sharp uh, version. Um, it's really about providing this abstraction, this uh, standard, okay? I don't know if you're familiar with what standards are, but for example, this is a, this is a standard, okay? Like the electrical outlet. <laughs> so you can, uh, what, what does this give you? It gives you that um, this spacing between the, the holes is standard, okay? So the people that are making devices to be plugged in the, in the, in the socket don't need to know who makes the socket, right? And the guys that make the sockets have no idea what kind of devices that will be plugged in here. Okay, so this is the same, this is the power that interfaces style will give you. Uh, and it's the same for uh, enumerable streams. So we want to be able to do the same. So the, the data structure just needs to give me the interface, my socket, and then they have no idea what kind of operations I will do with it, but it's assumed to be very useful, okay? So let's go. Let's go in detail, and uh, it's actually important. This is the first slide that is very important that we it's clear to everyone what it means. So let's go in detail to, to how you, you, you um, how the interface is laid out. So first, so the, the, the interface that um, is really um, implemented by the data structures is enumerable, okay? And you, you see it reads I enumerable of T. And T here is really it's a C sharp generic, so you, you, it can be. Um, this is the type of elements that is stored in the data structure. So it can be integers, floats, um, strings, uh, whatever data type you have. Okay. And the only thing the, the the interface requires the data structure to implement is this function called get enumerator, which is give me basically an object, this iterator or enumerator. Give me this object with which I can iterate, with which I can stream the elements in the data structure, okay? <coughs> so what is this iterator? So uh, we will go into what this means later, but basically what the, the only thing the iterator does is you can ask of the iterator, okay, move to the next element in the, in the list. And it returns uh, this Boolean true or false, indicating whether there are more elements or not, because it, it may, may have finished. And if there are more elements, if, if, if there were uh, an X element, then you can access that element with a current uh, property. And uh, this will give you the, 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 the current element in the iteration, okay? So why, so first question, ah, and then this disposable over here is important for one reason, which is in the process of doing this iteration, um, there are resources that are needed for the iteration itself. And this can become clear, for example, if you are uh, accessing the database, you, you may need, the database can be a remote, can be stored remotely in some server, and you have to open a connection. And at some point, if you want to stop, let's say you just want the first two elements in the database, you ask for it, and then you want to stop the, the iteration, okay? At that moment, you need to actually close the connection and get rid of all the resources you, you, you used. So the iDisposable is another interface which only provides the dispose method, which allows you to just uh, <coughs> close whatever resources are needed for the, by, by, the, by the situation, okay, that's the only thing. But why, so why do you have these two interfaces and not just the one? So why doesn't the data structure just implement this one? Well, because each, in a way, each iteration is um, unique. So for example, I can have a data structure and it, the data structure is the same, but I can have multiple um, clients taking data from, the, from, the, from that data structure in parallel. 
okay, for example. And uh, you really want to have each client to have its own data stream, okay? So uh, get enumerator gives you that. So it gives you, um, this iterator is really a new object for every client that was interested in accessing the elements, okay? Is this clear somehow? Yeah? It's not confusing for everyone, cool. So what does it allow you to do um, once you have these data structures um, laid out in this way? So what it allows you to do is you, you can start programming with, um, with streams. So the, the goal that, that where we would like to get is to, to code that looks like this. So let's say I have some enumerable so now I don't know if, again, so now I don't know if it's an array, a list, a remote database, um, whatever it is, and I just wanna sum. And now the sum, if it's implemented in terms of that interface, it will work for all data structures. It doesn't matter how it's uh, laid out. And, but then even more powerful than that, you can actually define um, new enumerables, new data structures, just in terms of this interface, okay? So we will go in detail as to what this means, but essentially we would like to be able to do things like this, where I just say, let's say I wanted to sum all the numbers greater than 10, okay? I would like to say something like this. So I take my numbers and I ask, okay, where my elements are greater than 10, this is just a test. I don't know if you're familiar with these lambda expressions, but it's basically a way to, for you to pass a little function that uh, will test each element for a condition. So you also have them in, now they're, they're becoming quite popular in uh, modern programming languages. You have them in Python, and I think even in MATLAB, you have something like this. Um, and the idea is you just pass a little function. So this will, is a test that will run for every element. So you, you ask, okay, give me... So x, so x is equal to Yeah, x, x is, is an arbitrary um, name you give, uh, which is just, to, so that you can use, this will represent the number that arrives, and then you can use it over yeah, here. Yeah, it's the argument of the function, yeah. And it's type in, it's implied. The type is inferred, but it's another thing that is powerful with these lambdas, is that depending on the data type of the structure here, the x will have um, that data type. Very conveniently, you don't need to declare it explicitly, which is also very, very handy, uh, or more compact. <laughs> And, and it allows you actually to do more powerful things because you will see that not only, so we will be able to create new data structures, but also we can create new data types on the fly as you go. And so the, this is important, this type inference, because you, you may actually have a type that you, don't, you didn't know you had beforehand. You're creating as you go, so it's important. But anyway, that's, anyway, the, 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 the idea here is that when you really, when you call this function where, what you're really doing is you're creating a new data stream, okay? So now you, you have, uh, is a data stream of numbers, but only the numbers greater than 10. But it still respects that same interface, okay? It's still an enumerable. So because it's an enumerable, now you can still call sum. So it's an operation that creates a new... Yes. The operation that creates a new... Yes, yes. so the, 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 this function represents a bulk operation, yes. Uh, of filtering the data for this x greater than 10, okay? And it creates a new enumerable, but actually one thing that is, another thing, and this is an important point that, that is, um, may not be clear exactly from this, is actually, so where, where is the iteration actually happening? <laughs> this is another thing that is very powerful here, is that when you define this new data stream, actually nothing happens. So if, if I just call where, and I pass this um, x, okay, x, uh, the condition is x greater than 10. Actually, if I just left it here, nothing would happen. Uh, and only when I sum will I um, start unrolling the data structure. And this will be computed on the fly as the iteration progresses, okay? And this is really because of this interface over here, right? Because when I call get enumerator, uh, I get this object that I can iterate with, but I, I only have to provide 
the object, but I don't need to iterate it right away. Okay, I can, I can iterate as I go. So really the only thing this is doing is creating a new kind of uh, object that when it's needed, it will go to the numbers and kind of filter the elements like that. We will see this uh, going in, in practice uh, in Visual Studio, and I think it will become very clear. But really, uh, I just want you to bear in mind at this moment that um, when, you, when you do this, you're defining a new data stream, okay? And then you can sum, as you could do the numbers. And then you can do even, you can com combine more of these. So you can, now you can say, okay, I want a sum of the square of all numbers greater than 10. And then you can apply, okay, the where, and now you apply the select operation, which is really a transformation, a transform from um, an X to another X, to another um, value. In this case, you just multiply X times X, and then you sum. And then you could imagine combining this with even more complicated operations that will um, go along. Another way to represent what is really happening to so these bulk transformations, and this is just an introduction to something, a, a visual tool that we will use um, as we go along to explain more complicated operations, um, is these marble diagrams. And the idea is that they really represent graphically um, a stream of, um, of data. So you have uh, the arrow that indicates just the, the progression in the sequence. And the idea is you have these elements coming in one at a time, so it's a sequence of elements. Uh, and then you have the, your operation here. And then below you have the resulting sequence, okay? So the idea here is this is a representation of the where operation, so you have some kind of condition. In this case, I say I want to filter for uh, circles. And you see you get this initial data stream of many different shapes. Uh, and then you pick all the circles. So you end up with a data stream that looks like this, only has two elements, no matter what their color. This is the marble diagram for a select. So now I have a function that turns circles into diamonds. Uh, and I get, um, so I get a, this stream of circles and I turn it into a stream of diamonds, okay? And sum looks a little bit different because essentially the, the, <coughs> the detail of sum is that it will add all the elements. So really the, the data stream that results only has one element, which is the sum of all the, 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 the original elements. So you start with a stream of uh, values and you end up with a stream of only one value, okay? But, but you can still consider it to be a stream of just one value. So that's, that's how you can, you can kind of toggle between these two ways of seeing it, but hopefully it is um, clear. Um, yeah, questions at this point? Doubts, things that are not clear. Also here is select doesn't generate your list on your Exactly, list. exactly. You can actually compound these operations and you can just wait until the end can delay, this is another thing that makes it very powerful, is that all these operations are kind of lazy. And you can iterate only at the end. Um, and you can take, and, and sometimes it's even very powerful. For example, imagine you just wanted to take the first element, for example. You don't even need to go through the entire list because it goes one at a time. So you can, um, it can be very computationally efficient sometimes if you do it this way. Okay. And more questions? Is it good? Yeah. More questions? No? Okay, so this abstraction, as I was saying in the beginning, is really what powers databases, okay? So you can look at a, a data table in a database as a stream of rows, okay, with very with different attributes. Uh, so in this case, it's a, a database of people with uh, names, age, height, and uh, weight. Uh, and you can see it uh, as a stream that, um, that gives you access to every row, and then you could filter and call. Then if you, if you are, for example, I don't know if you're experienced with the SQL or these database languages, uh, they're actually the same operation. So you have where, select, actually the, 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 the very names of the of these um, operators originally came from this SQL uh, language. So you can do, and if you, I, I will not cover them right now, but you, you even the more powerful operations like joins, um, if you're familiar with them and there is powerful aggregations you can do like uh, averaging and all of this can it, it actually exists already in this uh, data stream language 
okay? Now, the thing that is interesting is once you have this abstract interface, it turns out there's one more thing that you can do that is um, very powerful, which is you can actually add streams that don't even have a data structure as a backing. Uh, uh, and when, why is this? Because really the only thing that matters is that I, that I implement those functions. So the get enumerator and my uh, iterator, okay? So what I have here as an example is, let's say I want to create a stream of random numbers. Okay, and so what, what do I have? So it's the, my random stream implements the enumerable, in this case, enumerable of the uh, integers. And so it only implements this get enumerator, and this is the implementation. It creates a new random iterator. And this iterator, the only thing that it's doing is it has the current value, so the, the current value in the stream, and it has a random number generator. It's a, just a class, an object. And the move next, it's really, when someone asks me for a new value, then the only thing that I do is I generate a new random number and I say, oh, I have an X value, okay? And then I, re I return that value. There's no dispose, there's nothing. And that's it. So, so basically this becomes an infinite stream, okay? Because you can always ask for more numbers and it will kind of um, give you, it's uh, infinite, uh, but you don't need to represent the, this infinite stream. Okay, in explicitly in memory. It doesn't even need to exist. Uh, is, is it clear? Is it the example works for everyone? Uh, so just, so this seems a bit clunky because you have to implement all these methods and it turns out that these ideas um, of streams, the, defining these streams computationally in this way is so powerful that in C-sharp and sometimes in other languages as well, they provide specific syntax to make this very easy. So in uh, C-sharp, you have what they call iterator blocks that provide a very convenient syntax for uh, creating these enumerable streams. So you can create them actually just like this. So this is um, an enumerable stream. A so this is a function. I'm defining here a function called generator that um, returns an enumerable stream. And the definition of the stream is really just um, it's a there's three returns from the function. So this is the first change. Usually in a function, you return only one element. In these uh, iterator blocks, you can return multiple elements uh, by, instead of defining return, you define yield return. And what does this um, mean? It means that essentially behind the covers, so behind the, 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 what it looks here, code is being generated that really implements something like this, okay? in a way that is special that whenever you return a value using yield return, some state will be stored that remembers the, the, the point where the computation was, okay? And when move next is called again, you will jump to the same, to the point where you were and continue from there, okay? So this, this example should read relatively intuitively. It says, okay, I will return a zero and then one and two. So this is just a sequence of three numbers um, that is specified in, in this way. I can show you, maybe it's better to show you, take the time now to show you really an example of this. Um, so let's see. So this is our um, generator function, okay? So let's uh, just need to insert here some code. To, uh, I didn't talk about this, but actually it's better. Since we've gone to the code, let me actually do it before we go to the syntax. So I can just call, okay, give me uh, call the enumerator. So I ask for, okay, generator function. It returns an enumerable. I'll call for, I'll ask for the enumerator. Okay, I have the enumerator over here. And I'm gonna say while enumerator um, move next. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to print console right line um, my enumerator, the current value. Okay. So let's just see what this code. So this is just using the interface. So I have the enumerable, I call iterator, and now while there's more elements, I just print them out. So let's is there a breakpoint and place this bit of code? Sorry. 
So let's see what happens. So I ask for the enumerator, and actually nothing happens at this point, okay? And now I'm going to ask for uh, the move next. I'm going to ask to move to the next element. And now you see that I go inside the function, okay? And I'm going to hit the first uh, return. And now I actually stop. I go out of the function. Okay, I continue. And now if I go to the current element, it's zero, which is the element that was returned. And I print it out. It should be here, zero. And now if I continue, so now I continue to the next, and now you see the control jumped to this point, not the first point again, right? It goes to the point where it was before, and then I go, and now I have here in the current, and I have the one, okay? And I print it out, and I have zero, one. And then again, I go to two, and again, I go to two. So that's that. So the reason this is powerful is that um, the C-sharp compiler is really for you implementing something like a state machine the, uh, beneath the cover that remembers all uh, where, it, where it has to go at each decision point. It's, it's very helpful that you can specify it in this way because then things become very powerful. Uh, so for example, our random number uh, generator could really be implemented like this, okay, which is much more readable. So a stream of random numbers is really just a random number generator, and then forever you you return the next element in the sequence. Okay, and this what what would maybe seem like a, a nonsensical statement in a, in a, the normal flow, which is a while through. You never do this, right? It will loop forever. But in this case, it doesn't really need to loop forever because at every point you're breaking the computation and returning an element. Okay. So it, it only loops forever if the guy that is asking for more numbers is also looping forever. And at any point you can, you can break this. Uh, and then we will see some examples later of uh, how you can handle um, uh, the exit state. So for example, actually maybe you can even, I'll, I'll show you this example because maybe it's useful to have, uh, so I'll run these random numbers here. You see, so I just, uh, so you see another thing that was uh, powerful. So I just um, replaced, okay, ah, sorry, this is a static function. But other than that, um, yeah. So, I, so you see this is another thing that is already an example of the abstraction network. So we um, just changed here the, the stream really, and now we have a, a stream of random numbers. But let's say, for example, that I wanted to do something. So in this case, random, there's, there's not really much resources that need to be freed. But let's say that we wanted to free some resources. So I don't know if you're familiar with the try blocks, but this is basically what we use for um, This is what you use to handle exceptions in um, in C sharp. So another thing that is 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 not was not maybe clear <coughs> from the interface is the following. So what happens if um, your code that is inside this, these um, iterators? What happens if your code um, breaks for some reason? So let's say you have some kind of database connection and the connection fails or you're computing something and you need a file and the file is not there or something like that. So what happens is that error, errors can happen inside the function. And in C-sharp you can, you can catch them using these try blocks. But in the iterators, there's another feature you can use with try blocks that is very powerful, which is this try finally, which basically means, try finally in C-sharp means that the code in the finally block, in this block over here, will run no matter what happens inside here. So even if there's an error here, even if this blows up for some reason, there's a guarantee from the language that this code will run. Okay. So now what is interesting is, let's say I, 
let's say that I'm iterating my stream and I print the first element, and let's say that I break my, um, ah, sorry, actually, before we do that, let me show you one thing, which is, this is also very tedious to do, actually, the move next in the current, and there is actually also syntactic sugar in C sharp to make this also much more readable. So instead of doing this get enumerator, uh, move next, and then current, and then you, theoretically you need to dispose in the end, you can actually do everything by just saying this. So you can just say for each, this is a construct, you can just say for each x in my sequence, um, I just want to write the x. Okay. And this is um, useful to have this block because it uh, not only is not only um, less code you have to write, but also it, it, it makes sure that things are done in the proper sequence, for example, that you don't forget, as I did before, to call this pose in the end of the iterator. So it does it for you. And now I can show you one thing, which is let's say I wanted to just print one element and then I wanted to break the iteration. Okay, I wanted to stop. What you see will happen is that the compiler will also guarantee that this code is run. Okay, when I break. And again, stop me if I'm going too fast. Maybe. But you'll see that. Oops, I guess I didn't. <coughs> stop in the right place. Okay, so for each, and I go to the random numbers, okay, I give my first random number, I print it out, and now I'm going to break, and when I break, you see that it actually jumps to the final loop. So it, it makes sure that whatever needed to be done to complete the iteration can still be done. So this is very convenient. We will, we will use this um, later. So, okay. <coughs> okay, so that was the um, iterator blocks. Questions about this? Yeah, this is. I guess you're good. either not allowed or not encouraged to refer to indices or specific elements. Exactly. This is exactly, this is the, the biggest point in this, is to, for this abstraction to hold. The, the, our uh, data stream kind of abstraction, there's no other way to access any element in the data stream either than just pulling out the, the sequence one by one. Yes? We didn't talk much about what stream is like the thing I would imagine you, you, you might want to say, look at only the recent data and not everything since time began. Yeah, yeah. We, will, we, will, we will go at this. So, so these this is exactly the, so now we hit, we hit the midpoint of the, of the this first presentation, okay? Now we're gonna see, because there's something weird here, well, not weird, but if you think about bonsai, that is this asynchronous kind of parallel uh, handling framework. In here, these data streams we've been looking at are still very passive. So in a sense, they, the, the abstraction here, it may not be what, what they do, but the abstraction here is that they only give you data when you ask for it. So you are kind of, they're sitting there, and you, and you, and actually it's, it's exactly the transition to the next slide, so the, they kind of work like these uh, fruit trees, okay? So they, 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 they are ripe for the taking, so they have this fruit, and you have to go there and kind of get the fruit one by one, okay? But they're sitting there very passive. You can, you can, you can still implement something like this, in, in, even in this data stream, in the sense that exactly because you are free of the data structure, you could imagine doing a stream in this way that I was coding it, that when you ask for the next element, it gets the most recent one, for example. You could imagine doing it like that. But uh, then you, you can also get into other issues that we will get into now. But, but this is the, but the main point, I think the deepest point you're hinting at is really that not every data stream is waiting to be picked in this way, okay? Sometimes you have streams that are a bit more like fishing. So you, 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 you just put like your uh, fishing rod and you have to wait for a fish to bite, okay? There's really no way to know when a fish will bite. It can, take, it can be one minute or it can be two hours, um, and you just have to kind of wait for it, okay? Um, I don't know, how long did we go? 
Do we, do we need a break at this point or no? No, this is too good. Let's continue. Okay, so, and the deeper point is really, and it turns out that in, in the real world, these are really the, the, the dominant uh, streams if you're inter interacting with the um, real life. The real world doesn't wait for you, okay? So you have um, monitoring systems, uh, user interface events, uh, hardware interrupts. These are all cases in which um, you don't really know, you, your system stops being a closed system, okay? And you don't really know when things will happen. So the, the, there's no way to know when a user will press the button, okay? It will just do whatever. It can take one hour, it can, it can click 30, uh, 30 times in uh, one minute, or it can click once every two hours, okay? There's no way of knowing. Uh, the same with the hardware interrupt, and uh, actually also the same with the monitoring system. So if you have some kind of camera or a microphone um, that you are um, um, using to measure something in the outside world, um, what can happen is that um, you can get the data through the device, okay? But you may, you, you may, usually the way people think about this, uh, like still the traditional way, is you have some kind of loop, that you have some kind of uh, rate at which you're sampling the system, right? But the problem is the rate still cannot, may not be fast enough, okay? So still events can happen in the world that are missed by your system, uh, and that's why people talk about the frequency of sampling, if it's enough or not to kind of pick up the events of interest in the world, okay? And the point that is um, done here, that is really the, the, the revolution that uh, this kind of RX, uh, kind of reactive way of thinking proposes is, there is really no good way to do this with, um, with the enumerable streams, with kind of the, the full system. And why? Because you, you, it's, never, it's never good. It's never good for why? Because there's three things that can happen when you represent your devices as these things that you are constantly asking for data. So one, is, one thing that can happen is you, you can be, you can be too, too slow, okay? So maybe you don't ask fast enough and then you will lose events that happen in between your calls, okay? Um, the other thing that can happen is if you're handling many of them at the same time, um, they can block, you can have problems, not because the, the rate of each device is, is slow, but because you blocked waiting for some more slow device, and then you go to the next one and uh, already too much time passed, right? So this is a bit like, a, uh, Eric Meyer, the creator of RX, gives this example of uh, calling, uh, calling your friends and you can call them from time to time to see how they're uh, doing. And if you are always calling, okay, uh, uh, João, how, we, how are things? And, uh, and João says, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. And I call Philippe and uh, then Philippe doesn't pick up. And then I insist a lot, but maybe I'm worried that Philippe doesn't pick up the phone. It takes me half an hour and doesn't say anything. And then I finally called out him and uh, basically he, he says, ah, well, if you had called me five minutes ago, I would have told you all these uh, things that were happening, but now it's, yeah, it's not, it's an old story. So it's, um, so it's, really, it's really an issue. And um, so you either waste three, and, if you, and you can also be too fast, okay? You can also be too fast. So it can be, maybe you have something that happens only every hour, but you are measuring it to the sensor that is uh, querying 30,000 times uh, a second, and then you're wasting resources. So why are you doing this? So, so the idea is that um, the re if you think about it in, in reactive terms, then you're really um, just in the time that you need. The, you will know when uh, it's like the, the other idea is instead of you calling your friends all the time, you tell them, oh, just call me if something happens. <laughs> and then they will figure out uh, what, uh, what rate is important. Anyway, but again, this is all about abstractions. But this is the basic idea that we're going to move into. And it turns out that um, we need to kind of upgrade this interface to think about it in, in, in these terms, in the reactive terms. Because as I was saying, this is more like a passive uh, data stream. You need to ask for values. And what we really want to turn it into is into an observable, what we call an observable stream. And observable is really, um, is a word picked to, to convey this idea a bit of um, like fishing or, or, a, or a catching things that are being thrown at you, which is you're, you're kind of observing, sitting there, uh, waiting for things to happen, okay? And uh, 
So this is the upgrade. So now I'm going to switch kind of between these two slides where I will basically go step-by-step uh, step explaining how you can actually derive the observable uh, interface from the enumerable interface point by point. So there's actually, and this was the, the, the big perceptual um, uh, innovation of uh, Rx, is the realization that there's actually a very close relationship between the passive data streams, uh, enumerable data streams, and these observable um, data streams, okay? So if you look here, you also have two kind of interfaces. You have the observable stream, again, of type T, and you have the, the observer uh, of type T. So before you had the enumerable and the enumerator, now you have the observable and the observer. And these, these names also come from this um, uh, published subscribe paradigm or the observer pattern. It's also called the observer pattern. Uh, and the idea is the following. So before you add this function called the get enumerator that gives you the iterator for you to ask data from. And now you have a subscribe function, okay? And it's actually, if you realize, it's actually the, the exact uh, reversal of what we had here because before the, enumer the get enumerator gives me the iterator and now the subscribe receives the observer. Okay, now I've passed it an observer to, that wants to be notified of events, uh, okay? And actually the disposable before it was um, in the iterator and now it's returned by the function. So the function returns the disposable which actually represents the connection. So it means it gives you an object that you can dispose to stop the observation, okay? This is also for other convenience uh, reasons that we won't go into the, um, too much, but it's the same. The disposable is still there, it's returned by the, the function. Okay, so now what does the observer do? Okay, so now the observer is notified of the, any new values that arrive. And the way it works is again this, the converse of this. So before you had what? You had, you asked for the move next, and you got a value saying whether there were more elements or not, okay? Now actually these, these and then you, you would get the, the, the elements by accessing this current property. Now actually what you do is you, you split these two functions into three, and one is actually um, on completed means basically replaces the Boolean value that was returned at the end of move next. So in move next, you, it, it, you computed the next element, and you got a value saying if the stream is done or not. Now, there's no test to do because the, the data stream just decides I'm done and it notifies the observer that the iteration completed. And this can happen at any moment, okay? So for example, you can even have empty data streams. So you can, maybe you, you go there fishing, you wait for uh, one hour and then, actually fishing is in this case, maybe the lake doesn't dry up, but uh, <laughs> But, uh, but you, you may have a, a stream that lasts for one hour and then, uh, and then it tells you, oh, I'm done, sorry, there were no elements. <laughs> you, still, you still need to be notified, okay? Uh, so, and, and this is actually the split between the, the completion test and the next test is also um, an important difference between the synchronous and asynchronous way of uh, thinking this because before the test was done with the computation of the next element and now, the producer um, defines what, when it is done or not. Now, if there's another value, what happens is you don't have to access the current property. Actually, the value goes to you. So you just, um, the observer just gets called um, on next uh, with a new value, uh, and that's it. And then there's this on error, which is really uh, matches what I was discussing before, that there's one more thing that is implicit here that is not explicit in the interface, which is there may be problems with this move next uh, method. So when I run the move next, there may be errors like failures in the connection or uh, file access or whatever. Um, and in, in this case, the move next throw an exception. Now in this case, the exception is thrown, it, it happens in the producer, in the observable. So he needs, so in a way, we, but, we, but, the, but the consumer still may want to be notified that the problem happened. Okay, so really to be fair to the implementation and to complete kind of like the dual, this dualism is, 
is you need really this error uh, function, which is when whenever, whenever, whenever an error happens, you pass it on to the observer, okay? But actually it turns out, and this is the nice thing, that these two interfaces are really the mirror, the exact mirror of each other. Uh, in fact, they, they have this mathematical property that is called they are dual of uh, each other. And why is that important? Uh, but before, before we go there, keep this in mind, I'll just to illustrate what I, what I was saying, the dynamics, I had one more example, a graphical representation of what I was trying to convey. This is the pool streams, the enumerable, versus now what we call a push streams, the observables. And this is the, just to show you what the, the dynamics were of calling. So this is, you have the producer is a data structure, the consumer is the client, uh, and you have here, um, so the consumer in the enumerable case starts by saying, okay, get the enumerator, and he receives back an enumerator, and then he has to keep calling, okay, enumerator move next, and it returns a value with the, um, uh, a value and the state saying it's, it's done or not. You can get something like this. So enumerate, move next, value true, move next, true, true. And then at some point you receive false. In the observable, on the other hand, um, you just pass, the consumer just passes the observer. So he's just the observer, subscribes the observer. And then really there's nothing else going on. The producer just calls the on next of the, on the observer directly. And then at some point it will call uh, on completed or on error, okay? And there's all, all, always this guarantee that every stream will finish with either an uncompleted or an error, okay? So these are really, as I was saying right before, questions, by the way, regarding this, this is an important, we actually need, yeah, I need to emphasize this a bit, so we really need to, there will be chances for this, but if you're comfortable with what this means, um, in the sense of what moments happen here. So here you have the subscription, then you have a series of uh, on next calls, and then you have the completed or the error call. All of these represent opportunities for, um, if you want to program one of these observable streams, these moments, the subscribe, the, the on next, completed and error represent chances for you to do something. And they will all be very useful when we are um, uh, programming our own uh, streams. So it's uh, important that you are kind of aware of this kind of flow. So the, the, the subscribe, the next, the completed. Okay, is it clear? Is, is it possible to set some kind of filter conditions on the subscription process uh, similar to what we are performing in the state? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so actually it is exactly because of this function over here, right? So the, subscri the subscription operation is part of the observable, right? So let's say I had one observable that had one way to do subscription, okay? And then um, let's say I have another observable that kind of wraps this, this uh, other, the first observable, and it has its own subscription, okay? Now inside the subscription, you can kind of control um, how, how the first subscription will happen. Now the problem is that you can't really, um, decide too much given this, because the observer is just an observer, right? There's nothing to decide upon. Um, so for example, one question people sometimes ask is whether you can do some kind of priority, like for the observers, for example, could be one kind of filter. So let's say I wanted one observer to be given, be called first and the other second or something like that. With this interface, no, you cannot do that. Actually. Um, you could imagine extending the the observable in weird ways to allow this, but it turns out that it's usually better, or you usually can, um, um, not better, but you can usually um, express this in terms of the, of the simple ones. We can, we can look at some examples. Keep, keep this question, and maybe we can, we can explore a bit um, different ways to do subscription that will be, will be meaningful. But, okay, but, but anyway, so if this is clear, then, if it's somehow clear that how the observable is a dual of the enumerable, how the operations map to each other, the advantage of this is that programming with these observable streams turns out to be actually the same, exactly the same as you programmed with the enumerable streams. So you can call the exact same operations. They will still work, okay? Uh, so you have sum for uh, reactive streams, where, select, all of these operations can be implemented uh, with the 
with the same kind of syntax and, uh, and similar semantics, of course, so now you're in the reactive phase, but, uh, but you can it is kind of feel like the same um, thing. And even now the marble diagrams, um, they're still applied exactly as they did before. But now with an important um, difference is that now you can interpret this first arrow over here as being time. Okay, so now, because before we were um, kind of um, arbitrarily saying that, okay, after I do the where, uh, I return this value, okay? But before in the, in the passive stream, this gap over here meant nothing because the only thing that happens is that at some point the consumer calls and there's no way to know actually how far apart the, the, these two moments are. But now you, you know, because now these guys presumably calling these events with some frequency or even uh, with no frequency. And it's when the events happen. So it's when the circle happens that it goes through the filter and the notification gets to this guy, okay? And now this, this gap over here, it really makes sense because if this is one minute over here, then you know this will be one minute over here, okay? So time, time becomes meaningful. The spacing here in the marble diagrams becomes meaningful in the reactive um, um, representation. So you, but you have still the same, thing. So you have select is the same when the, each uh, element arrives, it gets transformed and sum is the same. And, but now here, this is the gap of time where if you subscribe to this guy, now you'll wait for a long time until the, this guy is done. And by the way, I didn't explain before, but this little bar over here represents the completion, represents the, the, that the stream is uh, done, okay? So now what happens if you see is that you get all this data, you'll get notified, and then when the, the completed arrives, is the moment where the sum is produced, okay? So it's kind of like this operator is waiting for this guy to finish to report the sum. And then it finishes itself the, the, with, the, with the sum, okay? Is it clear? Are things clear? Okay, if, if this is clear, then let's see how we actually implement the, these, um, now these observable streams. So I showed you the iterator blocks before where you could very easily um, program the, the new enumerable streams. And there are also, um, so it turns out that for um, producing observable streams, you can use not just one method, but many different methods because of the nature of the parallelism that is involved. But it, it turns out it's very, and you can still use the iterator blocks, but I'll, I'll give you some examples. And, uh, and these examples actually have a nice um, feature that I will discuss. So, so actually now, this first example, so this is a single value sequence. One thing that I will say is the following. So um, these, all these examples that I'll show you right now are actually already um, sources for um, bonsai. So it actually turns out that um, the way that, I, that we wanted to develop the language from the beginning was that there would be a, a minimal layer of translation or ideally no translation at all between the <coughs> coding observable streams and having them show up in bonsai. And, and here's the, the, and hence, that's why there's no difference. <laughs> So you just, uh, really the only thing that matters is that bonsai knows which function is an observable stream. And so here you see I have a class called value source. So this will be a, a sequence with only one value. You see it kind of inherits from this source class. So it says it's a source of int, but really this is just a convenience. There are ways that you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even need to inherit from this and we, we will go into this in later. This is just a convenience so that you can uh, override some method that kind of gives you the signature that you need to put. So it's just, uh, the only thing you need to do is create this generate method uh, that returns an observable stream. And this is the, the implementation. So, the, so, so in, the, in the observable world, if you, if you want to just return, let's say a value, you have a function that um, does that. So this observable return 
what it does is a function that you give it a fixed value and it returns a sequence with just um, one element. So how does that work? It works that it stores the value, okay? And then when someone subscribes to the, um, to the sequence, it, it will immediately call the on next and return it the value and then complete, okay? Is it clear? So maybe I can draw it over here. So you have the observable, let's say, uh, return uh, of five, uh, and this is the observable, and then at some point you have some kind of the, the consumer, again, calls the subscribe, okay? And then immediately this guy calls on next with five. Uh, and then immediately after that on complete. Like that. Okay? And um, and this is immediately on subscription, and actually it can even be in parallel, right? So uh, let's say that many guys we're calling subscribe at the same time. This is another thing. Each of them will receive uh, its own value, and this can be even be returning, being returned in parallel. Okay, and that's the that's the feeling. Now we can see how this um, we can see this running over here. So let's I think I have, I have some examples here. So this is how it works. In, this is how it looks like in code. Let's see if I can break it. So this, here's an example of the observable return. So I just call observable return 42. And this gives, gives me um, the observable sequence with just a 42. And then what I can do is, so before I had the get enumerator, okay? Now what I have to do to so again, this is an important point. The same as the enumerables, when I actually define this, nothing happens, okay? It's the same, we're still in the same uh, paradigm. So I only define the observable, and things will only actually happen when there's a subscribe. The same as before, that something ever only happened when we call the get enumerator and iterate. Okay, so now what I do is I subscribe, and actually turns out in uh, Rx, they have uh, convenience methods for the subscribe because you presumably, if you subscribe, you need to define the observer that will do something with the, with the notifications. That'll, that could be a bit um, annoying to, or not annoying, but you could, you could, you have, you would have to implement it by hand <coughs> to, to, to do something. So they provide these convenience methods that allow you to just pass functions to do stuff with the data. So you, don't, you, you avoid having to implement the observer by yourself. So you, in this case, I'm just passing, okay, I want to subscribe to the value of this source. And the only thing I, I, I want to subscribe and I want to do with, for each value, I want to call right line. I just want to call print, basically, on each. Um, and now I added here this read line to basically wait for the, for the value to go through. You will see, so for example, so now if I run this, oops, sorry, I'm still running the other example. Okay, so now um, if I define the source, so still nothing happened, you see there's no print over here, okay? And now I'm going to subscribe, and when I subscribe, immediately I'm already printed 42 because it was, it was just immediately. As soon as you call subscribe, it returns the value, okay? And that's it. Um, now it, it would wait. Now these, these can, so before you also saw that there was this for each. So the, the, the for each was kind of like the synthetic sugar to consume the elements of the, the sequence. You also have some synthetic sugar if you want to wait for a value of the, of the stream over here, which is you can await the value. So you can also say, if you, want, if you didn't want to respond reactively this way, you just wanted the value, you could also just say await, and this is a keyword, 
a weight value source, okay? And this should, should be a weightable. Ah, I have to be in the inside of the sink method. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, let's talk about a sink weight uh, another time. It's slightly, there's, um, maybe, maybe not. Let's talk about this another time, but there, there's, uh, just because I think it would take me too much time right now, but there's also some kind of syntactic um, conveniences <laughs> uh, to manipulate these observable streams. Uh, anyway, so but let's, another thing that is interesting with this example, ah, by the way, I forgot to mention this, but in your, if you were, People who are in the computers, and I don't know where the pen is, but there's um, a project being passed around somehow with, um, with these examples. It should be in your uh, desktop. If, it, if you're in the desktop computers, it should be in the desktop. What is the name? Bonsai Workshop. Oh, it's okay. a folder called Bonsai Workshop, and you can open it, and these examples are all there. Sorry, I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but it's still, still okay. We will we'll go, now it's the time that we will go. In more detail. Sorry? The pen, yeah, so this should be, it's probably somewhere. I passed it around. Nico has the pen as well. But if you pass it around, there, there's a folder called Bonsai Workshop, you can access it. And, um, and you, you, can, you can go through these examples. Uh, so we will go in more detail. Um, Tomorrow, but this uh, project, the bonsai workshop, we have three projects uh, which kind of go through the points that I was uh, going through the, in the tutorial in, the, in this uh, first class. So we have IX tutorial, is the interactive tutorial, which is uh, basically the enumerable uh, part of the tutorial. Then you have the reactive part, which we're seeing now. And then you also have this project called bonsai workshop. This project is actually special in a sense, and we will see in detail to, to I know, actually we will see it later today, but if this is a project that allows you to register with Bonsai, now the visual language, uh, allows you to register new modules, okay? And you will see how easy it is to actually get this uh, running. For now, I will just show you. Or maybe you can just do it, actually. Let me, I will do it now. Maybe it's a good way to, it's probably a good, a good time to introduce this, so let's do it. So I'm going to ignore this uh, project for now, and I'm going to create a new one, okay? So on Visual Studio, I just created, I just created add a new project. You can do it from the, also from here, from file, add new project, or you can write the solution, and I think at least on the on the um, desktops we did we registered the Visual Studio function, maybe not. But let's do one thing. Probably this is for everyone. Uh, so bonsai comes with a set of uh, project templates that make it very easy to set up projects to extend the language. Okay, and uh, but you need to kind of install them in vis into Visual Studio. And to make this very easy, if you go to the start menu, okay, maybe if you have Windows 8, something like this will show up. And then you have, <coughs> you should have if you install Bonsai, if you if you write register Visual Studio, like so. this thing should appear, okay, if you have Bonsai installed. And you just need to run this little program, which will basically install the, the Send the templates onto Visual Studio. You should do this. So if you click, yeah, in this case it's already installed because I did it. Uh, but it, you should just say, it should, it should ask you if you want to install it onto the Visual Studio. And you just run it. And then it should be installed. <laughs> I think you may need you may need to close and restart Visual Studio, probably, to get this, to get this running. Uh, but after that, I'll wait a little bit.
Yes. The find the, the, the previous yeah we can go we can go back while we're waiting. You mean sorry this one. Yeah. Uh, so are we looking at a this represent how a consumer this whole thing? This so we're always using the observables right now from the point of view of the consumer. Yes. So, so why is the consumer asking the producer to return forty-two? Yeah. So so actually, this is this is creating a, a producer. So this is a, you can read this as um, create an observable, create create a producer that will return forty-two on subscription. So this is actually. This, this part over here is creating a producer. <coughs> and then, then you become a consumer by subscribing on the producer. So okay. it's like as trivial as producer. Exactly. This is like the basic, this is like the most basic producer you could, you could make. This is like a simple data source is just returning its value whenever you're asked. But then the, the advantages you could do, so for example, now I could subscribe to it multiple times, okay? And I forgot the 42, right? Now I'm just subscribing to it. And now if I run it, um, you will see that actually, wait, I run the wrong project. Uh, so if I run it, you will see that uh, I have four 42s over here. Right? So essentially, I created. The producer wants 42, and then the value is kind of cached. Mm -hmm. And then every time someone asks for the value, it immediately gets the, the, the value. Okay? Now, and this is an important point as well that we will discuss probably on the, well, maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe on the third day, which is a distinction between two kinds of, uh, so for some people, it may be confusing. Because if you look, so from the point of view of each consumer, the 42 is only produced once, okay? From the point of view of each consumer. But in fact, it was being pro produced multiple times, one for each um, consumer, okay? Now, this is a type of observable. It turns out there's one extra um, distinction between observables that um, shows up uh, often, which is the distinction between what is called a, a cold observable and a hot observable. Okay? And this is actually a simple rule. We'll go into this, I think, maybe more on the third day. But to give you an intuition, is the, the idea is a cold observable is a bit like the, um, like the passive data structures we were looking at at the beginning. So it's um, an observable that kind of has its value stored, waiting cold, so they're, they're, that's why it's the name cold, kind of like they're, they're there, sitting there. Mm -hmm. And then when a subscriber um, arrives and asks for the values, it, they're ready to handle. So this is a cold observable because the 42 is stored there, cool down, it's cool. And then whenever someone asks for it, it returns. The opposite of this is a hot observable. And the hot observable is an observable in which um, the, the values can be actually lost forever. So for example, this is, can be the case of a, a, a sensor screen, for example, a camera. You, you can have your camera and your, every time someone subscribes to you, you start giving the value, the latest value from the camera, okay? But the guy that subscribed first sees the, the, the first, the first images, okay, and maybe if some other guy subscribes 10 minutes later, it will not see the first images, right? It will start the, the stream from that point. So that's why the, the, there's a different kind of behavior that is called, a, so the camera would be a hot observable in the sense that it doesn't cache the value, it doesn't, it doesn't repeat the same um, values for each, it doesn't necessarily repeat the same values for each uh, subscriber. Question? <laughs> That's the, the, the difference, the difference. It will become quite important, and it turns out there's also ways, there's operators that allow you to go from one to the other. 
okay? So, um, for example, if you have a hot observable, you could turn it into a cold observable by caching. So you could imagine you have a guy that registers on the camera and now stores, so it's notified immediately of all the frames, but it stores them in memory such that now if many guys now ask the cache, not the, the original, it will be able to replay for them the values, okay? And, and, um, and conversely, you can, you can um, transform a cold into a hot observable by sharing in the sense that you, you, you instead of repeating the values, you just um, start pumping them <laughs> to the first guy that, uh, that arrives and then you, 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 you never go back. So, so there are operators to go uh, between this and we'll look at them in detail on the third day. Okay, so now if uh, everyone kind of has the, the templates installed, we can try and just do our project. So you will have, you will have this, this project already done, but I'm gonna show you how to create one because it will be useful in general. So if you add a new project, you will see there's many templates already built into Visual Studio. And if you go to uh, Windows, Visual C Sharp Windows, there should be a, kind of a bonsai entry over to the left with a single uh, project template, which is a bonsai package. So this is just, this is really just a way, this is a normal, a pretty normal C Sharp project with the only difference that um, hooks are in place to make it really easy to debug because the one thing that needs to happen, and it's really the only thing, is that Bonsai needs to be aware of your code. So the editor, you have that here. So the, the visual programming language, you will see it opens up um, and it, it loads the packages that are kind of registered. And if you wanna extend the language with your own packages, um, you need to somehow tell to Bonsai where, the, where they are. Okay, uh, and there's many ways to do this. We will go through them in more detail tomorrow. But uh, the, the easiest way, if you just want to see some code running, is really just run this template that uh, creates a bonsai package. Uh, so you can just give it a name. So this is just a um, Rx example or Rx package or a Rx tutorial, doesn't matter. Actually, tutorial cannot be, but let's say tutorial package. So I create a tutorial package, okay? And it creates a project. Uh, it comes with a couple of files. Uh, it comes with an example transform that we will not use right now. We will talk about what they are. Uh, but now I'm gonna ignore that, all that. And I'm gonna proceed to immediately, so I have now the, the project here. And immediately I'm going to add a new item to the project, so a new file. And also for little files, you have a little bonsai entry over here that gives you temp templates for creating each one of the most common um, bonsai kind of uh, extensions. So you have templates for creating sources, uh, transforms, syncs, visualizers. We'll go to what these are in detail. Um, but for now, let's create a source, okay? So I'm gonna create my value source, what we were discussing value source, okay? And now I'm just gonna paste the code that I have here, uh, over here, okay? So the only thing that I did is I created a public class, value source, that inherits from source, and source is really a very simple class. This is a, a, a bonsai convenience class, that uh, an abstract class that just says, okay, if you, if you are a source of the type T source, then the only thing you need to do is implement this generate uh, function, okay? So if you, and we are doing that, so the, the implementation is very simple, it's just one line, it's just our return. Now, the only thing that is interesting here is we added, so you could have done this, you could have just done a, a number, a fixed number, okay? But we did it in a slightly different way that we defined a property in the class called value, and the, the value that is returned is that value. Okay, so we can kind of configure, we can kind of configure our source with the number we want to be returned. Okay. <coughs> so now, the thing with this project is if you set it as your startup project, 
Okay, so let's start the project. We'll turn bold here. Uh, when you run, so if you saw before, when we were running these, these um, program projects, it just went into the code, right? Started running the program. Now with this project, and this is the only thing that is special about the project template for bonsai, is that when you run it, it will automatically, for you, start um, bonsai. So bonsai. The bonsai interface will show up, uh, and you will see, so we will discuss this tomorrow, so I'll just be very brief now. Um, this is the interface for bonsai, probably most of you already have seen it at least once. And um, here to the left, you have kind of like a toolbox of all the modules that are available, listed by their categories, that we will, we will look into much more detail tomorrow. But if you go to the sources, now there should be a project called Rx Tutorial Package here with our value source. Okay, so, it, so the, if you just run it, it will um, register your code with the bonsai editor and you can now drag it or uh, just insert it as you would other nodes. Um, and now the interesting bit is that the property we created of the value actually now becomes um, part of the editor. So it, it, it recognizes that, so there's really um, nothing you need to do, you just need to declare the properties, and you will show up in this property, property uh, grid. And now I can write whatever number I want, okay? And whenever I return, uh, whenever I run the, the sequence, it will subscribe to the, to the to this observable stream and it will return the value. So now in this case, it's hard to see because as soon as you run it, it stops. <laughs> there's really, there's not really nothing to do. If you want to see it, we need to add some kind of, we will go in more detail what this means, but for now, just so I can show you, we can add a delay to this, um, just so we can see the value, okay? So, it's very fast. Or maybe I can just print it. But anyway, it's there. Yeah, we will, uh, yeah, we can put a different, let's, let's, let's continue, we'll see the, the more, the, the uh, subsequent examples, the next examples will be more uh, interesting. But anyway, the, 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 the first things to notice is making, um, making a node for bonsai or making a module for bonsai is really just a class, like any other class, that um, <coughs> somehow creates these observable streams, okay? And you create them uh, using Rx, the Rx operators. And these classes, uh, the, all, the other thing that they do that are special is that whenever you, you declare properties on them, they will show up in the editor, okay, automatically. Uh, okay, so that's the very first, uh, our very first um, bonsai source. Okay, that's single value sequence, it's as simple as you can get. So now let's try to get, so this is, as, as I was saying, this is a, a, a still very similar to, to our uh, uh, innumerable data structures. But now let's introduce a bit of uh, asynchronous uh, spice to this. And uh, now I'm showing here um, a single value asynchronous sequence, okay? Um, well, the other ones can also be called asynchronous, or asynchronous but here the, the, the point is the value before was being passed um, with a fixed value, okay? Now the difference with this um, synchronous sequence, with the sync value, is that imagine you had, you wanted a, a sequence that produces a one value, but let's say that value takes a long time to compute. So let's say you, it, it, it may take an hour or, or more, or something that is like a number crunching. Um, and you don't want your um, consumers to kind of block, this is the, the idea of pushing, you don't want the consumers to block while the value is being computed, okay? So the idea is you can, um, you can um, create an observable, now not with return, to this function uh, called start, and um, with start you pass it a function. So this is a little uh, another one of these lambdas that I was uh, describing earlier. So the, cur the curved parenthesis here just means that it has no arguments. Okay, so this means it's a function with no arguments, and this little symbol is yeah, 
the, the separation between the argument list and the, the, the parameter list and the, the body of the function, okay? And the function in this case, I'm just simulating, um, I'm simulating a, a, a hard computation that's still asleep, okay? So, so now my, my, my um, observable sleeps for a second before returning the value, okay? Otherwise, it's exactly identical. Uh, so now we can see how this, uh, you can see this running over here. So I have here the same again, the start. So the computation of the value is done asynchronously. So now you will see if I run this, uh, so I have my four 42s. And now it's waiting for me to hit the enter. Okay, now I'm here. I'm gonna subscribe. Let's see if I can show you this. So you see the 42s, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna subscribe to the function. And now when I subscribe, uh, actually, yeah, it returns immediately because I think the computation starts happening immediately when you when you call start. Actually, so it's um, because the value is then cached. So this is again a one. This is a one, um, I should have stopped at the point here. Let's uh, re-speak this again. Uh, okay, so, so now if I stop over here, you will see when I run this, it takes one second, and then it should show up the, or five, 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 five seconds here, because I paid 5,000. But after five seconds, it should show up the 42. Although, it's not the good news. Probably I didn't did now. Anyway, you get You get the idea. Okay, so that will be an example of an asynchronous, uh, synchronously computed value. Um, so now let's go continue of this. I don't know, shall I break for a bit or uh, is uh, it going to break to reflect on this? Yeah, maybe people catching up. Yeah, are we going to play a little bit now? I don't know, there's time, so. <laughs> is it noon? There's a bit more to go. We're very close to the end today. Um, but hopefully everyone had a chance to try a little bit, play a little bit with this, uh, creating these observable sequences. Uh, and you'll see that once you get the basic flavor of how they work, it will actually, or should be, uh, much. it should be simple to understand how, how to do a more complicated ones after I just show you a couple of um, more examples. So we've seen single value sequences, uh, but now let's look at the uh, multi-value, okay? And uh, so how can you create multi-value sequences? There's a number of uh, ways to do it. And it turns out the easiest way is you can actually convert, you can uh, convert an enumerable sequence into an observable sequence, okay? So, and what does that mean? So it means that um, if you have a data structure that follows the enumerable interface, it is very easy to create a, a kind of a wrapper that when that is an observable, that when someone subscribes, it will get the enumerator of the data structure, pull it, and then send those values to the, to the observers, okay, as notifications. So it's just kind of a, an, a, it's an adapter between two interfaces. Okay, an adapter is something like this, right? We have one interface is very useful, but then sometimes, unfortunately, you have another interface that doesn't fit, and you can kind of um, you can kind of have an adapter in the middle uh, that kind of turns one to the other. Okay, so it turns out these adapters, especially because the observables and the enumerables are so related, they are very easy to build. Okay, because all the operations map one to the other. So it turns out that if you have 
an enumerable sequence, you can convert it to an observable sequence by just calling this method too observable. Okay? So in this case, the only thing that I did here was I created an array. This is just shorthand syntax in C sharp to create an array with these elements, and then I call too observable. Okay, and what will happen is whenever an observer subscribes, it will bump these values uh, immediately on next, on next, all these values, and then in the end, calls on complete. Okay? Even more interesting, uh, because of this, you can use uh, iterator blocks. So the same iterator blocks we I was showing you before, with, um, with the, the yield returns, okay? you can use the same idea to convert them to observables. So now what I have here is I have um, an enumerable function defined as an iterator, so the same as before. Uh, so it's just a for loop with the yields. And now I have here, I'm simulating, I'm simulating some kind of um, delay in the computation of each <coughs> element. It takes a bit of time to get them out. We just sleep one, uh, we sleep a second. And now what I do is I just take that function, the, the generator, which is an enumerable, and I convert it to an observable, the same as before. Now, if you see here in this case, I used, I passed something here, okay? It is a scheduler. Now, we didn't discuss schedulers, and we will go in, in more detail what a scheduler is in the third day, okay? But for now, it's important to just mention that uh, when you have um, asynchronous uh, se sequences, these data streams, it's, it's sometimes very important to specify um, where or, or, how can I say, when and where they run in terms of processing, okay? So in the, in the enumerable data streams, the, um, the actual computation was left up to the consumer. So it's the consumer that kind of sets the pace at which things happen. Okay, in the observable world, because you, you, you are asynchronous, so the, the observables are kind of independent, it's sometimes convenient to, to say something about how they should actually run. So should they just start the thread and start running, or should they um, kind of use a more clever load balancing? This, is, this usually shows up when you want to kind of balance your load workload. You have many things happening at the same time. Most of the times, I have to say, you don't need to worry about them. Mm -hmm. But I, I will still mention them in the third day. But uh, I would say 90% of the times, if you're lucky, if you design the system just right, you don't even need to think about it. Uh, so here, why did I use one? So I just used the default. The reason is the following. So if you call um, too observable like that, OK? The, these values will be returned immediately on subscription. So the subscriber subscribes, and immediately on the subscribe, all the values will be pumped up. If I did that here, because I have the sleep over here, uh, I would have a block on the subscribe. So when the subscribe um, executes, the sequence would be evaluated completely with the blocks, with everything, and, this, and the, the, the consumer would be hanging on the subscribe which is maybe not something you would like if, if there's a, um, some kind of delays uh, here. So, if you have like a, um, an operation that takes time. Yeah, like a connection, like a, like a... Just like to prepare. If you need to open a connection to the device, if you are waiting for something you are going to happen, yeah. don't worry, get the guy that is trying to get the data, subscribe, yes, and then. Yeah, exactly. So, Basically, uh, what the only thing this is doing is saying, okay, instead, don't don't unroll the the sequence immediately uh, on the subscribe, but do it on a scheduler. So basically, this you can think it, you can think of it as run this on another thread, it, even though it may not even run in a new thread. It can be reusing a, a thread pool or whatever, but you don't need to worry about this. This just means that the evaluation of the sequence will be done asynchronously. So, so that the, the consumer is not blocked so by the... Yeah, to be notified as the values are produced uh, one by one, in this case. So this is just a way to kind of um, reuse the idea of iterator blocks. Um, 
and still still in uh, have them work in the in the reactive world and so this we can actually see this running this one may be interesting to to run so you see i have it uh, over here this is my async enumerable that i was showing you you have them in your projects as well so i'm going to just run the project and now we can actually see something more clear happening so um I'm going to just put my um, async enumerable. So this is the node. And now I didn't talk about this visualization. We'll see this more clearly tomorrow. But you see that the values are, that was basically the progression of the values being um, generated five values in sequence, and then it stops. Okay. Okay. So once you have this, uh, it's not so hard to go from this to a hardware um, kind of um, polling uh, strategy like the normal. So, for example, let's say you wanted to do um, a camera source. Okay, so we want to get images now from um, a camera. Okay, so in this case, uh, what do we need to do? We can use the iterator blocks to define. Um, our loop for getting images out of the camera. Okay, so now what is happening here? So I have this iterable, it's called, called frame capture. Uh, I'm going to use for this example um, OpenCV, which has these nice abstractions for um, uh, accessing uh, uh, cameras, and it returns. We will discuss uh, tomorrow uh, also the, the this other abstraction that is used throughout bonsai of uh, how to represent images and, uh, and um, multi-channel data. But for now, this is just a, this IPL image is just an OpenCV data type. It represents images. And they provide this function very convenient called a, uh, this create camera capture, just pass an index to the camera. So the only thing I'm doing here is I'm creating a camera, OK? This using is just a C-sharp shorthand to make sure that the camera is disposed, is closed when uh, everything is uh, stopped. Uh, and then I have a loop, again, this while true, and I'm just getting the, the I'm getting the, the frames out of the camera. So this is again an, an infinite data stream, so I can, I can get images out of the camera as, as long as I, as I like. Um, and at some point I will, the consumer can stop. Uh, and this will, um, and every and the idea is we just then okay we have this iterable, and now we just turn that into an observable, again with a scheduler default so that it doesn't block. Uh, and in this way we kind of create um, a hardware our first uh, hardware source. So very easy. You just have to. And in here the nice thing of combining these iterator blocks is that you can you can think of the, describing the access to the hardware as a little program. So this is just. You don't have to think about what's going on elsewhere. You don't have to worry about if the if the you if the people who are using your data source, they can create many of them at the same time. You don't need to worry about that. You only need to worry about your little program to access your uh, hardware device, kind of loop through it and uh, read the data, and then this will um, in bonsai you can so you can run it again. You can create a camera source. Um, and you can kind of, um, you could even put like many of them at the same time, okay? Well, of course, this will not work right now because they will try to access the same camera, which will be a problem. Actually, I don't even think this will work right now because uh, I have many cameras here to record the video of this, uh, of this talk, so <laughs> I don't think this will actually even, even work. Uh, but we can, we can try, see what happens. It probably won't, won't work. Okay. It did work. All right. That's the camera that is over here. Uh, and that's it. Okay. Let's see. Still working. Cool. Actually, it works. 
Okay, but uh, but you, you get the idea. So you have this little loop you write, um, and and you could you could now replace this by whatever um, whatever um, hardware device you have. You could do it simply like that. And then there's a couple of other things to be worried about, but uh, we can discuss them as we go along. Okay, final thing before we finish. Um, transforms, it's very, very easy. Now the sources are actually the, one of the hardest things, but now that we have these, this should be... So transform is now um, not creating a source, but it's the same as we were doing before. We want to process the data of some source and create other sources, okay? So now here, for example, I have a transform the, from int to int, and what, is, what this means is that now I'm defining a function that takes an observable of ints, so a sequence of ints, and it produces another sequence of ints. And it has, again, a property value, and the only thing it does is it projects the elements of, of the original sequence by multiplying the, the elements by the value. So the only thing this is doing is just take, okay, now I have a new sequence where all the original elements are multiplied by a value. That's the, very simple. Now, what turns out, sorry, what turns out to be, so this is very simple to understand, it's just the function is being applied. Now, the one thing that tends to happen sometimes is that your transformations may require some kind of state, some kind of, um, some kind of memory of what happened. Let's say you're building an integration or you're doing, uh, if you want to do a, um, for example, a common image processing operation would be like a background subtraction to segment. And the, the background can be computed dynamically or something like that. And you need to keep the memory of, uh, of something. Uh, so how would you do it in, uh, in, the, in the reactive world if you needed this kind of memory? So it turns out you can create local states um, for each observer, okay? by using this function called the defer. And really defer, the only thing that it does is when a subscriber subscribes to defer, okay, the, obser the observable that will actually be uh, provided is defined by this function. So, you, so now I have a little function over here. Okay, it's a bit subtle because it, it, it's the, the heart of functional programming with lambdas, it, you can capture states like this. So the idea is, Whenever a subscriber subscribes, this function will run, okay? So it runs, creates this variable accumulator, and it returns this observable, the select of this. And the state is the accumulator. The state is the accumulator in this case, yeah. And the subscriber will actually subscribe not <laughs> directly to the defer, but to the select, to this, this guy that I created over here, okay? And now because of the, I did this, now inside the select, I can use this variable, this accumulator over here. And now the result of this is actually, ah, for every element, I increment the accumulator and I return the result of that. So if this is a bit subtle, but you can play around and uh, see if you can get a feel for this, but I can show you um, what this will do is basically if I have now, let's say I have um, let's say a timer. This is just, I'm just going to put something repeating here. This is another source that is already built in the timer. And now if I go to the transform, I can put my accumulator in. Okay. And now the accumulator, it will just um, accumulate, well, accumulate um, forever. So it takes whatever is already there and adds the next element. Okay. All right, so the last thing we can, so these are transforms. So the, the idea of transforms is that they will take the elements, they're really like select that we talked about in the enumerable. So they're just, they just take the elements of the stream and transform them. So you start from one observable stream and you end up with another one where the elements have been transformed by some function, which is specified over here. Um, and finally, 
Another thing that is very useful, and it's the last bit, so we've covered sources, transforms. The last uh, kind of type of node to talk about is uh, sinks. And sinks, the, the, the point of sinks is encapsulating um, side effects. And what are side effects? Uh, there are things that happen that are not necessarily, um, they, they are, they're not important for the computation per se, but they will do something that, you, you, that is interesting for you. For example, the, the common example is saving data to a file, okay? So saving data to a file, from the point of view of the data stream, it doesn't change anything. So the same values will, will, um, they will come in and they will go out exactly the same. But the process of saving them to this is a side effect of the computation. Okay, so we don't want, we don't want to change in this case. We're not changing anything about the data stream. Um, and Rx already provides an operator to, to define the side effect. It's called do. So you just do is just means, okay, I'm gonna do something with this element, but I'm not allowed to change it. So the, the, the result of this fun function over here, you're not allowed to return anything, okay? But you're allowed to do something. And in this case, what I'm doing is a basic um, writer to file. Uh, and I'm using another, um, I'm taking the chance of this to introduce another uh, useful function, which is this using. So the idea here, what, what do we have here? So we have the sync of ints. I have the file name, which is my file name. I have the file I want to write to. And then the definition of the process is just using. So if you, if you remember back to this, remember I, I used here this using construct, and I told you that this essentially lets you initialize a variable, and when the computation is done, it will make sure that the, the variable is cleaned up appropriately, so that you don't, it will make sure that you don't forget to call close on the camera in this case, okay? Even if exceptions happen, even if errors and things blow up, it will still close your camera, okay? That's what using does. And here, the using is doing exactly that, doing exactly the same thing, but on the reactive uh, world. So you specify the same, if you're using, you have a function that initializes your resource, which is this, um, in this case, just a stream writer, is a, uh, a writer to file with a file name, and then you get your stream over here, and you can return an observable that does something with that uh, resource. In this case, what I'm doing is I take the X, and I just write it to the stream, okay? So what this, this will do? This will basically run things in this order. When a subscriber subscribes to using, it will call this function, create a stream writer, then return the result of this, the do. So then the, the, the sequence will pr produce notifications. Whenever they're produced, they will be written to this, but they will still be sent out because it's a do. They will still go out to the next guy <laughs> in the, the sequence. And then when the thing stops, the, um, so the production stops, but also the stream is closed. Okay, so when the, the when you stop the, 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 remember the, just to be clear that this goes through, remember the, the subscribe returns the disposable, which allows you to stop the subscription. So when you, do, I don't care about elements anymore, okay? So this allows you to close. When you close that, all the things that have these usings will be closed as well, okay? So they will be destroyed appropriately. And, um, and this will allow you to, to, to not be so worried about, so this is, this, this is what allows you to just do this. So I just now, if I start again this, so I now I have my, uh, let's say my async enumerables, my, I can now do my accumulation, uh, accumulator transform. These are all nodes you created now. And you can now do um, our file, uh, our, I'm gonna call it, is the, we called it, no, the, file sync, yeah. So I put our own file sync, okay. And the idea here, so, so now I can actually use, take this chance, we'll review this tomorrow, but we can, 
one thing you can see in the editor is each of these nodes, it should be clear now that they are observable streams, okay? And the type of, of that stream is given if you right click here on the output, it says, for example, this is an int, okay? Now the, the transform over here is also an int, same. And this will be transforming the values into new values. Now this guy is still an int, okay? But now the values that go through this guy are still the same as this. And this is very interesting because now you can carry on doing your stuff without worrying um, about the fact that this here is things are being saved to this, right? You, you can even save them to multiple, multiple files, okay? And it doesn't really matter. So you can save them to different files, okay? And you don't have to change anything about your, uh, the rest of the program structure. So, this, so these things, the, the, the advantage of them, they can be just popped, popped up some, uh, anywhere in your, um, in your uh, workflow, and, um, and they will just work, okay? So for, Same thing as what was happening, what I was saying in the enumerable streams, where the execution is lazy, okay, where the yeah. the things only unroll. So you, you're making these operations, but you're not really doing anything to the data until you actually are pulling, until you start pulling. And here is the same thing. So the you're, you're when you're building up all of these nodes, nothing is really happening until the end when someone subscribes to this guy. And then the, the values start being produced by the source and they are pumped through all the nodes and, for, and that element does everything, all these things. It's transformed, it's written, and so on. Yeah. So that's an uh, important thing to realize. That's uh, also what allows many things to be very efficient, this, this kind of thinking. So, okay. I think we need to stop because it's almost time for a... Uh, for, uh, internal seminar, but before we finish, I just want to say that we have our uh, assignments, okay? So the idea of the assignment that we came up with is to give you the chance to play um, home uh, during, this during, during this week, okay, that we are here, to try and do something um, that you think would be interesting as kind of a, um, uh, an exercise. Like, uh, it can be as complicated or as simple as you like, uh, depending on how much time you have. Okay, uh, and it can actually be whatever you you like. The the really the challenge here is we will be here the whole week. Okay, so we can help you if you want to be more ambitious or less ambitious. But we can we can we can count on us to be available to kind of uh, help you do something that is interesting. Uh, and our challenge is really. Very simple, it's just code your own source, transform, or sync for a bond site, okay? And uh, I gave some, we gave some examples uh, based on things we discussed, but it's not really exhausted. You don't need to do any of this. You can, you just need to do one, or it, it can, it doesn't need to be these yeah. ones. You, you can also, but if you want to work with, I don't know, if there are several, you can do it in pairs. In pairs, ah, yeah, this is yeah. important, so yeah, you don't need to, this is, does not need to be an individual project, so you can team up as you like. Um, but the idea would be try to do something that you think would be interesting to integrate with the bonsai for your own use or for other purposes. Yeah. So we have here some examples, like for sources, we've discussed for a while integrating uh, web sockets. This is nice for like a network. Um, it's a, a very popular data streaming uh, par uh, paradigm that is emerging for the web. 
we would like to at some point to have this in bonsai, so it would be nice that you can play with this, it's kind of interesting. If you have like your own hardware um, uh, data acquisition boards that are not supported by bonsai and you'd like them to be, you can try and uh, code them, integrate them so that you can use them. Uh, cameras, joysticks, other hardware devices you might uh, have. We will help them, we'll help you uh, do this if you're interested. Uh, on the transform side, you can think of algorithms uh, to process data that would be interesting to expand what Bonsai already offers, that you will see tomorrow. You can think of uh, new tracking strategies or spike sorting or uh, classifiers for data, whatever you think would be interesting. Uh, for syncs, you could think of uh, support for new file formats. So NEV is a uh, popular format for spike sorting data. You have HDF5 is a popular binary format for um, data, data, data spaces. Uh, you can think sync, syncs. Another thing for syncs is you can also think of visualizations as syncs. So the, the idea is the, it's a side effect, right? So the, the data is going through and you're just plotting it in some way that is uh, interesting. Uh, and there are many ways in Bonsai to do this as well. So you can um, you can you could do that if you, if you find it interesting. Uh, so really, whatever you 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 find, let us know. We will um, think about it uh, today, and you can even start thinking about it today. But tomorrow we will go to you and uh, kind of catch up and see what you decided and uh, help in whatever way we we can. Just remember, if you have any possible yeah. So, because if you're already here to code, it's nice. If you have a sample of code, it's nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. So, anything that you can think that we would be useful, yeah, is a good chance to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> All right. And, uh, that's it. So, thank you very much. And, uh, you can.